Welcome to Peds Dog Talk TV. I am Dr. Mona Amin, a pediatrician and mom to a toddler. And on this video, we're talking all about plagiocephaly, or you may know it as flattening on the back of your baby's head. I'll be discussing why it seems to be happening more than in decades past, prevention tips, some visuals on what it looks like, and when you should consider helmet therapy. Remember that if you are an expecting mom or have a baby who's under six months of age, join the New Mom Survival Guide, an online digital e-course and community created by me to educate and empower you through that first year of motherhood. Not only do I have content about child development, child play, I also include topics on feeding, sleep, and so much more. Before we continue, make sure you hit that subscribe button because that's how you stay up to date on all of my content here on Feeds Dog Talk TV. And here we go. Plagiocephaly is an asymmetric flattening on some portion of the head. It's usually on the back or the side of the head. This is sometimes called flat head syndrome. I'm not really a fan of that terminology or deformational plagiocephaly. This condition is very different than something that's very rare called craniosynostosis. Craniosynostosis is when a baby's skull bones fuse together sooner than they should. In every skull, there are sutures. So sutures separate the different portions of the skull. And in this condition, a part or maybe some of the sutures are closing prematurely. This is very different than deformational plagiocephaly or common, you know, flat head that you may see. That is why it's really important that if you have a concern about your baby's head shape, that you bring it up to your child's clinician. Clinicians should be looking at your baby's head at every visit from the newborn visit to assure that there are no abnormalities, head shape concerns that we need to evaluate. Craniosynostosis is a condition that needs a referral to a neurosurgeon because sometimes surgery is indicated. This is something that is very rare, but we do want to recognize it as something that's very different than positional plagiocephaly. Like I mentioned, in craniosynostosis, there is an early closure of those sutures, which causes an abnormal head shape. In positional plagiocephaly, the sutures are still open, but due to friction and pressure to the soft and malleable skull, we can see some flattening in certain spots. Your job as a parent is not to know the difference between craniosynostosis and positional plagiocephaly, but your job is that if you are concerned about your baby's head shape, that you bring it up to your clinician so that they can do a thorough exam and determine what or if any evaluation is needed. The first six months of a baby's life is when the skull is most malleable or soft. Ossification, which kind of means hardening of the skull, happens closer to about six months of age. Of course, the skull is still growing in size at six months of age, but it's a little more harder, less malleable. So that is why we commonly see positional plagiocephaly in those first six months of life. So why are we seeing more flattening of the head now in 2022 versus the 80s when we were babies? Well, a lot of this has to do with the Back to Sleep campaign that was initiated in 1992 by the AEP. This was an effort to reduce the incidence of SIDS, which is very important, encouraging parents to put their baby on their backs. Also, marketing of things such as swings and rockers have meant less time in tummy time for babies when they're awake. So back to sleep is really important, but we have to also remember tummy to play. When your child is awake, you want to make sure that you are doing tummy time when you are watching them and when they're awake so that we can encourage that head shape to stay nice and round as much as possible. And also tummy time is really good from a motor perspective for development. Things like rockers and swings are okay for those moments where you really need your baby to be somewhere when you're not able to hold them. However, I really want you to watch this video on baby gear and baby containers where you can learn more about how to use these items effectively for your child's development. We see flattening from using these items such as rockers, swings, or car seats because the friction of the head against the surface of the item can cause the soft and malleable skull to become more flat in certain areas. So we want to make sure that we optimize playtime on the floor as much as we can. But like I mentioned, watch this video for more information on how to balance the use of containers or baby gear for your child's development, including head shape. In 2017, 3.8 million babies were born in the United States. Of those babies, over 720,000 had a diagnosis of positional plagiocephaly in the first six months. So this is something that we do commonly see, which is why I really wanted to do this video. Another really important thing that we have to always look out for when we're discussing flattening of the head is a condition called torticollis. So sometimes babies can have a preference to lay on one side of their head. So maybe they're lean more on their right or lean more on their left. That is preference. But it's really important that if we're noticing flattening of a baby's head, 
or regardless, if we don't even see that yet, that your doctor is doing a neck exam to make sure that there is no tightening of the muscles in the neck leading to that condition called torticollis. Torticollis is a tightening of a muscle in our neck called the sternocleidomastoid. Now they exist on both sides, on the right and left side. This can be congenital where it happened in the womb, or it can be something that they acquire later. Congenital torticollis, which means that they were born with this and something that we see at birth, can happen due to intrauterine positioning or delivery. They're in a tight, tight space, and sometimes their neck is cream like this, causing the sternocleidomastoid to get tight. If moderate to severe, it can lead to a preference for leaning to one side. Because their muscle is tight, or restricted in that area, their head is going to be tilted and subsequently we can see flattening on that same side of the tightening. It is my recommendation that if your baby has torticollis, seeing a pediatric physical therapist would be of benefit. They can help show you how to do stretching techniques. They can help guide the progress of that torticollis and help prevent flattening that has happened because of that tight muscle. Before we get into the management of flat spots, let's talk about prevention tips, which I've kind of already mentioned. Number one is assure that it's not torticollis. Like I mentioned, if there is a tightening of the neck muscles, it is a good idea to see a pediatric physical therapist. They may show you some techniques. You may have to only go a few times, but I think this is a really important thing so that you are equipped with everything you need to to reduce their risk of developing flat spots due to tightening of that sternocleidomastoid muscle. Number two is limiting the time we put our babies in bouncers, swings, car seats, only using them when they are necessary. For example, you're transporting your child in a car, you're going to need a car seat. But when you get home, transport them out of that car seat. Watch this video for baby containers and baby gear for more information again on how to balance this with your child. The next tip I have is really great for every baby if you can remember to do it. So I want you to put your baby in the crib alternating ways every time. So I have a crib behind me, but one day or nap time, you're going to put them this way. The next time you're going to flip them and put them this way. Sometimes babies will have a preference of looking at something that's on the wall or looking at something exciting that's across the way. So by alternating and putting them different sides, you're going to encourage them that if they're trying to fall asleep, if they're looking around, that they are going to move their neck and turn the other way. Now, I know you may not remember this. There's so many things that are going on as a new parent, but you try your best. It's something that we did. And so you could use day by day and you said, oh, I've been always putting him down this way. Then the next day you'll put him down this way. So it's okay if you forget, it's not the end of the world. This is more of a big picture to think, let me alternate it. And our son did the same thing. He really loved looking at some designs that we had on the wall. We had some decals that we put on the wall. So he would look at them when he's trying to fall asleep. So by alternating the way you put them down, you can help in allowing them and forcing them to look at different things with their neck muscles. The next tip is during playtime. So during playtime, it's great if you can practice tummy time. Now parents freak out about tummy time. Make sure you purchase my new arm survival guide that where I have tummy time tips, including something I call tummy time bootcamp. So you remember how to do tummy time and foster that love for being on the belly. Remember, it's not so much the amount of tummy time. I just want you to get it in your mindset that we're going to try this every day. Some of my favorite ways to do tummy time, which I also have in the new mom survival guide, is the basic one where you have to be awake, where they are just laying on your chest. This is also really great for social and emotional bonding, but remember, you should be awake. This is not for nighttime sleep. So if there's any chance that you're going to fall asleep, I need you not to do this for safety reasons. But this is a great way they can start to practice tummy time from the newborn age. You don't have to wait for the umbilical cord to fall off. You can start doing it right away on your chest. Another method is putting them chest down over your arm. So you're putting them chest down, supported by your arm and walking them around. This will encourage them to lift up their neck and use those neck muscles. I also love basic tummy time on the floor. If that's not something they're comfortable with, you can either roll up a towel and have their chest over the towel, put their chest over a boppy pillow, or you can have them directly on the floor. To encourage them in tummy time, you can lay down on the floor with them, which I discuss in my new mom survival guide. You can put mirrors or toys to excite them. You wanna make sure you make it encouraging so that they're more likely to do it. When they're not in tummy time, and let's just say you're doing floor time in general, putting mirrors or toys all around can also help for them to increase their range of motion. Sometimes if we play with the same thing and don't have anything exciting on the opposite side, they're not gonna be forced to use their neck muscles to look around more. So perhaps putting a mirror on a side that they do not have a preference for. Just say your child does not have torticollis and just likes to always look at their left. 
And because of that, they're developing flattening on that left side. Start to put yourself or a mirror during play on that right hand side so that you're encouraging them to look around more and help reduce those chances of flat spots. And the final prevention tip, avoid head shaping pillows. Head shaping pillows are not safe for unattended sleep. And even if you are watching your baby, the best thing that you can do is tummy time, floor time without the head shaping pillow. We don't need anything else there. We just want them to be practicing on the floor, doing tummy time when you're awake. And from a safe sleep purpose, try doing the alternating of putting baby this way, putting baby this way inside the crib so that they can work their head muscles and hopefully prevent those flat spots. So now let's look at some examples and visuals of what flattening looks like. And this will guide you in determining if you need to intervene, when to speak to your clinician. So in this visual, you see a normal head shape on the left. In the middle is unilateral plagiocephaly. Fancy term to say one-sided plagiocephaly or flattening. So you see on that right side. In a very severe case, which is what you're seeing here, you can also see that the ear is moving forward when you're looking from above. This is why exams become very important at the doctor's office because we are going to assess, is it causing disruption in the head shape where you're seeing the ear go forward as well. The picture on the right is brachycephalic head shape. This is essentially a bilateral flattening that has made it appear that the entire back of the head is flat. Now that you've seen the differences between a normal head shape, positional, unilateral plagiocephaly, and brachiocephaly, let's talk about when it's mild, moderate, and severe, because I think this is important as well. Okay, so in this visual, it's really important, and I want to talk about the lateral deformational plagiocephaly. Again, Fancy term to describe a positional plagiocephaly. So in the mild, you can see that the flattening is on the back of the skull, but you don't see that it's affecting the front of the head or the ear placement. In moderate plagiocephaly, you're going to see that there's flattening so significant that it's also caused the right ear to move forward and the forehead on that right hand side to also move forward as well. And remember, this is looking from above. In severe, we are seeing that it's even more so, that that right ear is being pushed forward and that we're also seeing frontal bossing, meaning the forehead on that right-hand side is completely moving forward and causing deformation. I think knowing these differences are really important because it can dictate our management when you come to see us in the office. So when you go to your child's clinician office, they should be doing an exam of the head and neck. Sometimes they're doing it so quickly that you may not notice. But if you have a concern about your child's head shape, or tightening in the neck, I really want you to actively bring it up to your child's clinician. When we are looking at a child's head, we are looking from this way. So when I'm examining, I am looking from above. It's not enough to just look straight on because I'm not gonna be able to see the back of the head. And I can't look like this. I have to look and have the baby sit up. So sometimes I will have the parent sit the baby up and I will look from above because I'm gonna be able to see that the ears are aligned and also the back of the head is also round and not flat in any spot. So it's really important that if you're concerned, you can also look at your baby that way as well. But your child's clinician should be assessing the head shape from looking like this and also the neck muscles. So that's really important. And that's something that we should be doing from the newborn visit all the way until the baby's six months of age to assess the head shape and the neck muscles. Now, most commonly we see positional plagiocephaly between the ages of one and three months. Remember that this is because of that soft, malleable skull. We start to see some flattening on some parts of the head. It is really important that before one month of age, if you are noticing any flattening of your child's skull or any abnormal head shape, that you bring it up. Why? We wanna make sure is this positional plagiocephaly that's happening a little bit early or is it that condition called craniosynostosis? Again, we will determine that with you, but it's important that before that one month mark for any abnormal head shape that you seek an evaluation so that we can intervene sooner than later. If your child has torticollis at any point, whether it's at the newborn visit or at any point in that first six months, it's important that you seek attention from a pediatric physical therapist. Now I have some families that come in that are like, look doc, I don't have time to go. I'm so overworked. And I tell them, look, this is something that I want to intervene with because it can really prevent the flat spots. So even if it means going to the physical therapist for one visit, getting the stretches and telling the physical therapist that, hey, I have time constraints to be able to come every week, you may not need to go very often. This is something that, again, is early intervention. The earlier that we intervene and teach you the skills and stretches, the better outcome there can be in terms of reducing the chance of flat spots and also stretching out those neck muscles. 
Sometimes with torticollis, it can take a long time for those muscles to get released or stretched out. The goal is monitoring with a professional, which in this case would be a physical therapist that is trained in this area. So now if you have a child who has positional plagiocephaly, just say it's a two month old, what do you do? Now, if it's mild, like I mentioned here, where it's not really affecting any head shape whatsoever besides the back of the head, you really want to do those prevention tips that I mentioned. If you look back and you're saying, you know what, we actually do use a lot of swings or bouncers, we wanna really try to move them out of that. Really go back to the alternating of the side in the crib. Remember, remember, remember to do the prevention tips if it's mild or even if your child doesn't have plagiocephaly. Because for mild plagiocephaly, we don't really need to intervene with helmet therapy as long as the child does not have torticollis and as long as you are doing the prevention tips. If at the two month visit, I see a child with moderate to severe plagiocephaly, of course I wanna evaluate for any torticollis, anything else I'm concerned about, but I'm gonna really drive home that importance of the prevention tips. If a child comes back at four months of age and I'm still noticing very significant flattening, and again, that moderate to severe flattening, which is causing frontal bossing of that forehead or the ear to shift forward, so obviously we see a normal baby alignment here, but if that ear is drifting forward and if we're seeing frontal bossing in any degree of the forehead, it is going to be recommended that we seek helmet therapy. So my goal is educating about prevention tips, which is what I mentioned already. But sometimes with prevention tips, we will still see moderate to severe plagiocephaly. And this really has to do with some kids just have really soft and malleable stools. So I don't want you to beat yourself up if you have done all those prevention tips and your child still has plagiocephaly. That is why I hate using the term flathead syndrome because I feel like there's a lot of shame and guilt surrounding baby helmets when it really shouldn't be that way. I have seen many well-meaning parents who have done everything in prevention and their child still developed flattening. It happens, some skulls are more soft and malleable than others. So do your best, but I do wanna discuss the benefits and when you should consider helmet therapy. Before we talk about helmet therapy, people have asked, well, is this cosmetic or is there any impact neurologically, developmentally to my child if I don't get their plagiocephaly corrected? Now, largely we feel as a medical community that it is cosmetic. However, in the Journal of Contemporary Pediatrics, there was a small study looking at 336 nine-year-olds and assessing their cognitive and academic scores. All of these children had positional plagiocephaly in infancy. What they noticed were that their cognitive and academic scores were average. However, the children who had moderate or severe plagiocephaly scored lower than the children with mild plagiocephaly. Now, this is not the best study because it doesn't compare against a general population, children who did not have plagiocephaly, other factors. As I've said before in many parts of my Pete's Doc Talk platform, many times we are not seeing the big picture when it comes to development. What other factors? Development is largely multifactorial. So are there any other things that we can see in this study that we can add to make it a more reliable study? One big thing I will say is we need a bigger population size. We need to compare it to children who did not have any plagiocephaly and also look at different socioeconomic and genetic factors as well. Sometimes that's really hard to do in a study. I wanted to present this information because I think it's important for us to know that it was in a peer reviewed journal. I'm not too worried about it, but I really think it is something to consider getting an evaluation for your moderate to severe plagiocephaly. Even if it has nothing to do with the neurological developmental outcome, which could or could not be true, I'm being very honest, I think it's important from a cosmetic aspect. Sometimes we don't like to say that this is something that's cosmetically not great for my child because we feel superficial, but I don't think that's a bad thing to say as a parent if it's something that we can intervene with. So if you make the decision to do helmet therapy, if you make the decision to see a physical therapist because you don't want flattening of the head, I want you to own that decision. That is okay, that is your decision. There is so much shame and guilt around helmeting, around flat heads, you did everything you can, and now we have ways to help if your child needs it. So helmeting can work. There is not a really great study that looks at plagiocephaly with helmeting versus not. So again, this is a parent's choice, which is why I'm doing this video. I want you to know the prevention tips, and I want you to know that if you are deciding to do a helmet, the things to consider for your child. I find the happy spot to be between four to seven months. So like I said, at the four month visit, if a child is coming into my office with severe, moderate plagiocephaly, I'm having this discussion about helmeting. I'm telling them, you know, what we need to do. I'm discussing that even if they decide not to do helmeting, the importance of prevention tips, 
the things that I mentioned before. If they have torticollis, I'm driving home, but they really need to see that physical therapist. All of those prevention tips, whether they decide to do a helmet or not. I really don't recommend it for mild plagiocephaly because again, for mild plagiocephaly, I really want them to continue doing those prevention tips. It's really more if it's causing that ear to push forward, like in this picture, or if it's causing the forehead to boss forward. That is considered moderate to severe plagiocephaly and when you should consider perhaps the discussion about a helmet. Why is it this becomes a benefit versus risk situation? Now, what are the downsides of using a helmet? Number one, it can be time consuming. Your child may have to be in this helmet for 23 hours a day. Now, how long your child will have to wear the helmet, meaning how many months or weeks, will depend on how severe the flattening was and how they're responding to the helmet therapy. But because of how time consuming it is, it is something that you have to consider. And also because they're in that helmet for long periods of time, some children with eczema or cradle cap can have flare ups. Sometimes they can develop friction rashes. Sometimes they get really sweaty. So it can be uncomfortable for some children. The other factors are the time and the money. So not all insurance plans will cover helmeting. They consider it cosmetic, so they don't cover it, which is unfortunate because I do think it can really help if it's very moderate or severe and you did all your prevention tips. So it can be very expensive and also the time involvement. You're going to have to go to more visits, more assessments to make sure the fit of the helmet is okay as they grow, to make sure that they are responding to the helmet therapy. And again, that can be expensive in its own right, the time that you're putting into the helmet therapy. And also, like I mentioned, the stigma. The stigma is really bad. And I hope by watching this video, I can destigmatize helmeting if it's something that your child needed to do. And if you are watching this and you're like, oh, I would never have a child that needs a helmet or I would never let that happen. I really want you to have a little bit of compassion. I, as a practicing pediatrician, have talked to many families who have done the prevention tips like I mentioned. They've done everything they can and sometimes their child has a flat head. Every child has different malleability of their school. So your child and another child could be the same exact age. You used rockers and swings the same amount of time and one child will have more flattening than another. Everyone's skull is different. So we do the best we can, but understand that there should not be any shame or guilt. My goal of this video is to educate and empower you on flattening of your baby's head. Preventative tips are important, but if you find yourself that you have done the preventative tips, or maybe you're coming here because you didn't know any of this and now your child needs a helmet, I wanna support you and offer you resources on how to proceed. I do believe that there is a lot of shaming, especially on social media. Once we see a child have a flat head or a helmet, some accounts are like, well, you should have, could have, would have. My purpose of this video is to give you those tips, give you that support wherever you are in your baby's journey. Thank you for joining me. Make sure that if you are a new mom or have a baby who's under six months of age, you join my new mom survival guide. Information available in the caption. Subscribe to Pete's Stop Talk TV to stay up to date on all of my content. And I'll see you next time.